Good morning again, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us again today. Um, I, I'd just like to start with uh, um, a few thanks and acknowledgments again. Uh, first of all, uh, once again, to acknowledge that we are we are meeting today on uh, traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, and we're grateful for that opportunity. And uh, we are also very thankful for the support of the, the summit from several um, sponsors and partners, including Roundhouse uh, 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 Community Arts Centre, Max Guide, and Access to Music Foundation. Uh, we have um, uh, an incredible day for you today that is um, uh, going to be all Richard all the time, I have to say. I'm relieved about that myself. And uh, if, if you were um, not able to be with us at the end of yesterday, uh, when we uh, presented some highlights of the feedback from our uh, community cultural roundtables and the um, BC Creative Convergence initiative. Uh, there is a document available here uh, today that is the, is, is the report and the recommendations as they came to us directly from the over 600 participants in that process. Um, so please uh, take a look at that and uh, with your feedback from yesterday and additional feedback that I'm sure we'll receive uh, over the coming weeks, we'll, we'll be um, uh, putting together the mechanisms for the next steps of continuing to feed into that process and, and using these tools now to engage with our uh, government staff and, and political uh, um, uh, figures. And uh, we want all of you and many more to be part of that process. Uh, so today, um, uh, we have our uh, very special guest, Richard Evans, uh, who will l lead us with a, a, a keynote address this morning, talking about his work in adaptive change, uh, some case studies in uh, the session following the break, uh, with some guests uh, uh, who have been working with him and, and who have uh, been uh, experiencing firsthand the impact of this work in their organizations. Uh, and some hands-on workshop uh, activity this afternoon, which will all take place in the exhibition hall. And before we get there, uh, the end of the morning session, uh, when, when lunch begins, uh, we will also take that opportunity here in this room to conduct the annual general meeting of the Society to Bridge Arts and Community. Uh, and we invite anyone here who is uh, a member of the Bridge Society uh, or any guests to remain for that, for that meeting. It will be a very, very, very short and efficient meeting, um, uh, probably about 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, and a member of the Bridge Society is anyone who is a, um, a, a board member or former board member of the Bridge Society. Um, or any member of the Alliance for Arts and Culture, because the Bridge Society is our sister organization. It's a charitable entity, and its programs include uh, being home to uh, BC Culture Days and assisting with projects like the um, Mayor's Arts Awards. Uh, so at the end of the morning sessions, I'll just remind you that anyone who wishes to stay for that meeting, uh, just stay in the room, and, and uh, you'll get to your lunch after about 10 more minutes. So. With uh, no further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Richard Evans of EMC Arts and hand it over to him. Richard. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Rob, and welcome to everybody. It's great to be back in Vancouver. I was at the Arts Summit a couple of years ago, and I've made many visits here since then. Um, and when I was speaking a couple of years ago, it was really very early in us working to partner with arts organizations and funders in Canada to do work around adaptive change. And two years later, we now have active programs in Edmonton and Calgary with discussions going on here in BC, but also all the way through to the Atlantic provinces. So it's been an exciting ride. And there's a lot of interest, I think, in how the arts community can respond to the rapidly changing circumstances we all find ourselves in, in a way that is rational, but also imaginative, and takes us in new directions, and how we can improve and strengthen our capacity to do that. And that's what we're really going to focus on uh, throughout today, and get a variety of different perspectives on. 
the ability to improvise, to hold a plan lightly and uh, change direction rapidly in response to altering circumstances, the ability to play well with others, but also know how to play a, an individual role, the ability not just to duck and weave, but to think intentionally about what we might do differently in order to reach our goal. These, of course, are the qualities that make for a good soccer team. <laughs> and I promise you that's my only reference. Except to say that, you know, I realize we could do worse than just follow the soccer venues and set up programs across the country, right? In Vancouver, in Edmonton, we got that one, in Winnipeg, in the Atlantic provinces, and in Ontario, and maybe even eventually in, in Montreal, who knows? Um, but uh, we're going to look at this question of adaptive change from a variety of perspectives today. The, the basic question being, how can we respond effectively to sustain and increase the impact and relevance of our arts organizations during a period of really disruptive and rapid change. And we're going to look at that first through my talk now, in which I'll give some background on the thinking that's led us to the work we're doing. Um, and it's particularly exciting to be here now because there is active planning for a program in Vancouver and across the province. Uh, and I'll end my talk by saying just a little bit about the kinds of elements that will likely inform that program, which I hope will interest all of you. Um, then, after the break, we'll hear from, as Rob was saying, two organizations that have been involved and are involved in innovation and adaptive change. Uh, Darcy Trufin, the uh, chair of the board at the Art Gallery of Alberta, will be with us, and Charlie Miller, the curator of Off Center at the Denver Center Theatre Company and each will have a different perspective and experience of doing this kind of work. And we'll hear from both of them, and you'll have the chance to offer a lot of questions to them if you'd like. And then this afternoon, um, we'll take a much more active stance, where you won't be the listeners so much as the workers. We're going to work on the kinds of complex challenges that you see the arts community across the province as facing. Not necessarily your own individual organization, but what, as an arts community, you feel you need to do to thrive and be of value in the future. And we're going to delve into that uh, and those questions and have you work to come up with a variety of different possible challenges and possible responses, um, which I hope will be a useful for the Alliance, useful for all of you as a way to think about how you move forward in the future. Much of our work is going to be about questioning assumptions, which in some ways I think is one of the roots of innovation. Um, and during my talk right now, I'm going to ask you a few times to turn and talk with your colleagues and neighbors in groups of four. And probably the best way to do that in broad terms is if two people turn around and talk with two behind them or something of that sort. So um, uh, as we do that, those of you who are out there on your own, uh, I encourage you to come in to make up a four or to find three other people that you can talk with and to easily three or four times in the next hour. And actually, let's start there. So what I might ask you to do, and spend just a moment in personal reflection on this, is to identify some long-held or fundamental assumption about your work in the arts, whatever your role is, as a funder, as a trustee, as an artist, as a staff member, uh, an assumption that you've been questioning in recent months, something that for a long time you've perhaps taken for granted, but which now you're beginning to question, does this assumption really hold anymore? Is it actually a reliable predictor of success for me and for our organization. And when you've spent a moment or two reflecting on that, I'm going to ask you to turn and talk and share what that assumption is. What is that old assumption that you're questioning and why are you questioning it right now? So just spend 30 seconds and reflect on an assumption that you're beginning to question. So now, if you will, um, find three others close by you, whom you're going to turn to again a few times uh, during the talk, and share your assumption and why you're questioning it. Let's spend five minutes.
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. If I can have you pause in your conversation. And we'll come back together. Thank you. I may as well do the, uh, I may as well do the blanket apology right now because I'm going to have you turn and talk a few more times like this. And every time I do, I'm going to cut your conversation off just as it's getting really interesting. Uh, and I've learned to cut these off when the volume is rising, because that means you've got a lot more you want to talk about. Uh, but I, I hate to do that, so here's my blanket apology for that. And for those of you on the live stream, uh, I hope as we do these turn and talks, you can either talk with your colleagues where you are, or you can actually start up a private chat with at least one other person on the live stream. So why are we questioning assumptions so much these days? I think part of the answer lies in the fact that we're entering a new era for the arts. I think we're in a watershed moment of great transition and disruption, which is now maybe five, ten years old and is going to go on for perhaps a similar length of time. There was a first era of the professional arts community, I think, in the US and here in Canada. And I think it was essentially structured for growth. Um, this was the period in which we set up a really national professional infrastructure for the arts. And in the US, it was in 1957 that the Ford Foundation became the first national funder of the, of the arts to have a strategic national program specifically for arts development. And the lead they took was to grow the field. It's meant growth in the number of providers. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Let's have more arts and culture organizations all across the country. Let's also raise the quality of programs. There was a real push to increase the standards of artistry and enable artists to be better paid to do their work all across the country and to do so beyond the central metropolitan areas where the arts were already um, in full bloom, if you will. It also meant growth in audiences and participants. Uh, how many times have we had to write that annual grant report in which we've said how many more people we reached this year than last? Uh, we weren't successful if we didn't, uh, and also how much our budget grew over last year. These were the measures of success that got set up as our resources increased, and indeed as more funders at the federal, provincial, and local level came into this scene. And it wasn't with the Ford Foundation just that they had immense uh, resources, they did, they put billions of dollars into this over 20, 25 years. It was also that other funders that entered the arts field followed their lead in terms of the strategy for growth that they adopted. Now that may seem like a purely American story, but it's no coincidence, I think, that it was in the very same year, 1957, that the Canada Council was established after the Massey Commission and the report. And the same kind of snowballing or trickle-down effect of money from the, from the federal level to the provinces and then to cities and communities expanded the arts in a similar way as happened in the United States over about a 50-year period. Um, it makes sense that it was a private foundation in the States and it was public funding that led the way here in Canada. And this was, I think, tremendously successful. I'm not trying to argue that this was a mistake in any way. It was an amazingly successful approach to creating a genuine professional arts infrastructure. But it also led to what I call a, a value proposition getting laid down, which I think of as excellence and scarcity. Excellence because of this push for increased standards in our productions and exhibits and performances. But also a kind of scarcity, because what we did is we took the best artists we could find in our communities and we put together them together in ensembles or in exhibitions and then sold them back to our communities at the highest price they could afford. This was a, a great strategy to build demand and in many ways it really worked. But also, like any sector that puts its flag up for excellence, there is a scarcity mentality. We are different, we are the best, that separates the organizations and their artists from the community as a whole. And this did indeed drive demand and help create the wide and accessible arts infrastructure we now have. But now we face, I think, a, a real change. Change in demographics, generational changes, changes in the way people want to engage in the arts, perhaps above all changes in technology, allowing not just uh, disintermediation, as they call it, people be able to engage directly, but creating their own art online as well. So I think we're moving into a really new era, which in some ways I think represents the maturing of our art sector. And I think, I think of this new era as structured for resilience. And I use that word in a particular way. There are two kinds of resilience I've learned about. One is what they call engineering resilience, which is the capacity of a substance and material to snap back to its original form when the pressure on it is relieved. And that's not what we're talking about. 
What we're talking about is what they call biological resilience, which is the ability of species and organisms to assume new forms and shapes and to go on in those new forms and shapes and thrive in the future. It's a non-reversible uh, change, which is the kind of change I think our sector is now beginning to get into. And it's meaning some very, very different qualities in our organizations and in our cultural policy as well, I think. First of all, we're learning to operate in complex adaptive systems. No longer are we the only theater in town as we were 15, 20 years ago. There are now four or five with different repertoire. We're not the only gallery. There's lots of commercial and non-profit galleries and museums now in our town. And the uh, competition, in a way, from other sectors is perhaps fiercer than ever. This means a very complex system in which we can't just drive our own strategy through the system, A to B to C to D, because there are all these interdependencies that get in the way of that, and we have to take account of those. We have to learn how do we operate when everything is interdependent and what other people do affects us and what we do affects others in a way that causes a different result than if we were living just on an island. I also think it means engaging with our community's interests in creativity and culture in a new way. I suggested that to some degree we separated ourselves and performed or exhibited back to our communities. Uh, when the National Endowment for the Arts did a big survey of public participation in the arts a few years ago, um, it was a really wake-up moment for the arts community in the United States, I think, because they expanded the kinds of activities that they were asking people about beyond what they call the benchmark activities, going to the opera, the ballet, the symphony, museum, and dance, and so on, to include activities that could take place in a synagogue or a church, in a community center, or even at home. And what they found was that three quarters of Americans say they value the arts, and the arts have a significant role to play in their lives. But only 34% said they expressed that interest by any contact whatsoever with a professional arts organization. And only 8% did so exclusively through a professional arts institution. So the strange thing is to think about all those years of growth and that actually we've painted ourselves into a quite narrow corner of the overall expressive life of the country. And there is in fact a potential audience for our work with an avowed interest in the arts that exceeds the size of our whole set of audiences combined. It's a terrific opportunity. And when the Canada Council did a similar survey a couple of years ago, the results were not as extreme, but nonetheless showed that big gap between the level of interest we now have in creativity and the arts in our communities and the relatively limited reach of our professional organizations. If we can bridge that gap, then we have potentially the opportunity to be of greater impact and have much larger audiences or larger numbers of participants. But to do so means we have to have much more open and nimble structures in our organizations. Instead of differentiating ourselves from the other organizations in town, as we've been taught to by our funders and others in order to get that grant, organizations are beginning to realize it's nowadays about critical mass, lest we fall off the radar, that we can do more together than we can do separately in having civic and cultural impact. And this means the role of managers, artists, and professionals in our field is really changing. Sam Jones, who works for the think tank Demos in London, wrote a little while ago that the role of the cultural professional is changing from a model of provision to one of enabling. And what I think he means by that is that we grew up with this idea, it was about supply. It was about high quality supply of artistic opportunities. And that was our job, is to ensure the quality and consistency of that supply. Now, he's arguing, the role as, of us as professionals is to enable the expressive capacity and lives of the citizens in our communities. And that's a very different mandate, one that I think is already causing a lot of shifting in the way our sector operates. And I would add, I don't think it's just about an online engagement program here or a new outreach program there. It's about the very nature of the kinds of organizations which I think are going to thrive in the coming decades. Because they're based on a very different value proposition, which I call abundance and intimacy. The abundance of creative talent and interest in our communities. We live in perhaps a more creative time than ever before. And if we can tap into it with a kind of customer intimacy, which you might say is commonplace in other sectors, but which has not, I think, been a driver of arts development, then indeed we have an opportunity to thrive as never before. Another way to look at this would be to say, we spent a lot of time over the last 50 years, and particularly the last 20 years, focusing on this idea of stability. And we created all sorts of capacities in our organizations to promote this idea. Heroic leaders who are there to have a big vision and make the decisions that everybody else will follow. 
technical competencies in marketing, in development, in governance, in finances, that will help us ensure that our business as usual keeps on the rails of consistency and standards are maintained. This led to a lot of command and control cultures, very, very good at maintaining business as usual, but less good at finding the new opportunities and making change. And we underpinned this approach to how we would develop with what I call rational strategic planning, which laid out a five-year plan, which was essentially incremental in increasing our scale, our reach, our number of performances, our budget, and so on. Um, I wrote that, and I, I wonder, what's irrational strategic planning? <laughs> and then I realized I've seen a lot of that. Uh, so I put that in there. Uh, the future would look like the past, only more so. And we underpinned this financially with a desire as you grew up to get some kind of capital endowment to give us some shield against the vagaries of the marketplace. And to grow up as an arts organization was to get your own building. And facilities loomed large as organizations and as our sector grew. And again, all this was very successful. But I think what's happened in the last 10 years is we've begun to realize there's a whole other dimension to the capacities that our arts organizations need if they're going to thrive in the future. And I call this adaptability. And it's a very different set of qualities, some complementary, but really some quite in conflict with those that we've been promoting in the past. The idea of adaptive leadership, which instead of having all the answers, says we don't know the answers. The challenges are too wicked, the problems too wicked for any one individual, no matter how brilliant, to be able to solve them on their own. We need to bring people together in new ways to address complex challenges. This means much more cross-functional teamwork, getting out of those silos of different departments and giving people a sense that they're involved in the artistic juice of the organization at every level. This means more collaborative cultures, cultures capable of collaborating not only externally in new ways, but internally in new ways as well. And it means not trying to lay out another of those five-year plans and expecting things to be different, but actually learning how to continuously incubate innovations and new directions. I'm seeing change also on the balance sheets and the planning of arts organizations, putting much more emphasis on having the funds available for innovation when we know it's the right time for it. Creating uh, liquidity, more liquidity and change capital, capital on the balance sheet that we can invest in our new directions when the time is right. And my argument is not that all that stuff at the top left was a mistake and now we should move to the right, but rather that each organization has to find its own new balance between these two sets of qualities. And only if we do, and if our sector as a whole finds a new balance, rebalancing, I think, toward adaptability, will the trajectory of our public value and impact continue to rise. We might also say that we're entering an era more uh, dynamic and more uh, interfused and uh, interdependent than ever before. And this is meaning very different approaches to the way we design our organizations and our sector. We're used to hierarchies in our organizations, not just in the arts, but in many other sectors. But we're moving much more towards networks. Associations nationally that used to have huge memberships are, fine, are struggling now. The American Medical Association used to have 95% of doctors in America as members. It's gone down to more like 55 because local initiatives, local networks, regional networks where doctors can get the services they need have grown up much more and they're in contact with each other. So this idea of a networked universe is really changing the way we need to behave. Moving us from the idea of hub and spoke, that our organization puts out messages to our patrons and they reply to us and we're the center of this whole sort of wheel uh, of interaction and influence. Instead, we're finding that there are decentralized movements arising where there is no central leader, where there is no hub and spoke. Like on Facebook, these group forming networks um, that create movements across the country. It means the role of the leader is changing from the competitive hero uh, to the collaborative host, the person who can bring people together in new ways. And this means that while strategic planning in the traditional sense may still be useful for incremental change, we're learning to move away from trying to predict the future in that way to actually working in complex adaptive systems in a much more experimental and short-term way. As one of my heroes, Adam Kahane, says, these days, one reason the future can't be predicted is that it can be influenced. But influencing it means dealing with complexity, I think, in new ways. And complex situations are ones that we tend to want to think will be like this. We have a vision of the future, we put our plan together, and then over time, in this kind of stepwise motion with all these inputs and outputs and outcomes, we reach our vision. This is a traditional theory of change or logic model, if you will. Uh, but when we're dealing with complex challenges, it turns out to be like this. 
which is not, I think, because the world is random. I think it's that the experimentation, probing, and sensing that we have to do to find the next practices for our field does not conform to any kind of linear progress. And we have to learn how we can change direction and learn much more rapidly. This can be very bewildering. We can feel as though there's really no road we can take. And we, we cannot de even define the challenge often quite so easily. We, we used to know the rules of this game, but suddenly the landscape seems to have changed. And we're not sure what's going to happen next. So we end up being very perplexed. And quite often, I find, in arts organizations, we end up being paralyzed. And what we do is we say, well, let's deal with the technical stuff. Let's do with the improvement in the marketing or in the stage management or in our financial management. And we'll deal with that complex stuff next year or the year after or sometime. So we end up doing very little. And what I find is really important is to be able, therefore, to better understand how, when we want to achieve certain goals, what kind of challenge we're facing. Because on the basis of that understanding, we can respond in ways which I think can be much more attuned to the environments in which we're working. And I want to suggest to you that there are basically four domains that we pass through when we're trying to reach our goals in organizations. We face challenges which are simple, complicated, complex, or chaotic. And in the middle is this funny dark area of uncertainty or disorder where we really don't know what, quite what's going on. So let me just give you examples of these, and I want you to try and apply these to your own organizations that you may be affiliated with. If our goal is to bake a chocolate chip cookie, it's a relatively simple challenge. Because we can go home, we can pull out that recipe book, and as long as we buy the right ingredients and follow the recipe, we can pretty reliably turn out a good chocolate chip cookie, even me. And the fact I can do it once using that recipe is highly predictive of the fact I'm going to be able to do it well again in the future. It's known. It's a known challenge that we can solve. A complicated challenge is essentially not that different the classic example is the space rocket. We need a lot of qualified engineers who know about all aspects of that machinery. We need a good blueprint from the whole. And in theory, we can go home and create a space rocket. It's knowable. There are experts out there who can assist us in getting that work done. But neither of these approaches works when it comes to the complex. The classic example, of course, is parenting. <laughs> and those of you who've had the joy of taking on this wonderful burden, particularly more than once, will know that what applies to one child doesn't work for another. That what worked last week doesn't work next week. And the initial conditions have a huge impact on what's successful. And half the time you don't even know what the problem is. <laughs> These are the classic conditions of complexity in which we cannot see any direct relationship between cause and effect in the way we could with a complicated and the simple. We can only, in fact, know that relationship in retrospect when we look back on what happened. And there is no formula for parenting that we can use. And then there's the chaotic, where there really is absolutely no relationship between cause and effect. And what all we can really do, at least organizationally, is intervene to stabilize the system enough to work out where we might be. I wish I'd had this insight, uh, but I didn't. Um, it was done by a wonderful group of people led by a man called David Snowden and about 10 years ago turned into what's now called the Kenevan framework. It's an old Welsh word. He's an old Welshman. Um, and it means something to do with domain or habitat, but with an implication of stories we will never fully know. And the point about this categorization is not so much to say, OK, now I understand the types of challenge we face, but to say, what kind of response is liable to be useful? And my proposal to you would be that in the arts, we've spent most of our time in the last 50 years on the right-hand side of this picture. We go to lots of conferences and we hear from the elders of our field about the best practices that we should align with. We create those in our own organizations and pass them on. And they're really useful when it comes to simple challenges. Or we get technical assistance grants to help us bring in an expert to tune up our marketing or our fundraising. These are really good things to do, but neither of those approaches is of any use when it comes to dealing with the complex. And just to make things worse, I've come to realize that we're in the complex where we need to probe and sense and experiment to find emergent practice for our field. We're all actually in this room and on the live stream experts in our field now, in our own different ways. So we want all the challenges we face to look as though they're complicated or simple. So what I find in arts organizations, we often disguise complex challenges to make them look as though they're complicated because then we could probably solve them and we can burnish our reputations while we do so. 
one of the challenges for dealing with complexity is that experts have got very little they can do for you. And I often say that actually it's the non-expert input that comes from people not affiliated with our organizations that can be so very powerful when we're trying to deal with complexity. Let me just give you an example of a couple of uh, challenges that came up in dealing with organizations that will help you understand the difference between these different d types of challenge, because I want you to think about this for your own organizations in just a minute. For instance, to make uniform financial data available for public scrutiny. We may hate it, it's really boring, but we can do it because there are rules and regulations out there that we have to follow in our financial statements or our audits. So it's a very known challenge uh, that's relatively simple to accomplish. An example of a complicated one might be to improve access to our programs and events via shared online ticketing. This is doable, it's knowable, but it's a lot more complicated because we have to work with others about the interests that their patrons have. We have to make sure those are integrated in a way that is seamless but gives the right experience for our patrons. We have to persuade our box office to deal with shared ticketing. <laughs> but there are experts out there who've done this, who we can bring in to help us make this happen. But a very different type of challenge for this organization, at least, was to have the organization consistently at the table when it came to civic and neighborhood planning. This was an important goal for this organization, but it hadn't achieved it. It had tried stuff, but it clearly recognized it needed to do something different than what it had been doing to, to get through to this goal. It was a complex challenge where there was no obvious answer, where their current strategies just weren't cutting it, and where they had to think differently in advance of acting differently. And then maybe an example of a, of a chaotic challenge is, how do you respond to the sudden unexpected loss of a major funder? It puts the organization into crisis, and you have to act really quickly with some triage to find out what you can really do in the longer term. So I hope these distinctions between the kinds of challenges make sense to you. You'll see that each of them is expressed in terms of a goal, and which of these domains we have to pass through to reach that goal. And that's what I want you to be thinking about and talking about in the next few minutes. So to return to the picture overall, here's the question that you might consider. What goals does my organization have that will likely be complex to achieve, that need us to do something different and probe and experiment? Because we either don't have any strategy to achieve that goal, or the strategies we have are not paying off, perhaps not paying off in the way they used to. Why do we need to act differently? So I'd like you again to turn and talk for a moment and share with your colleagues and neighbors example of a goal that's coming to your mind as one that seems complex to achieve. It's a complex challenge to get there. And just for a few minutes discuss why is that complex? Why do you feel like you need to do something differently? And just, just share one of those if you can with each of you in a group of three or four. We'll just have five minutes so I'm going to cut you off again. Uh, and share on the live stream if you will, if you're sitting with someone in your office or set up a private chat to talk for a few minutes about What's a complex challenge that your organization faces? Thank you. Okay, it's once again cut-off time. Again, draw your conversation to a close for a moment. The volume was just getting too loud. Again, my apologies, but uh, hold on to what you're thinking about those kinds of challenges. And I realize when I introduced this that I spoke of organizations, and there may be many of you in the room who perhaps are unaffiliated with an organization as an individual artist or consultant. Uh, but I must say my experience is that you can apply this way of thinking to your personal practice as much as to an organizational practice. So I hope you will do that if that's your situation as we go forward, because I want you to think a bit more about those kinds of challenges as we move forward. When it comes to responding then to different challenges, um, Ronald Heifetz, the great scholar and teacher of adaptive leadership, suggests to us that there are two types of responses, which I think are very much in line with the Canavan framework. The first he calls a technical solution or a technical fix, which is when we actually improve our current strategies or we use best practices or we bring in experts to help us do better with an existing strategy. And these are always important. I know no arts professional who turns up to work without thinking about how can we improve the way we do things. That's always going to be important. But Heifetz makes the point that these days we're facing many more challenges, I would call them complex, 
um, that demand of us a different kind of response, what he calls an adaptive response, which means diverging from our current strategies, not extending them, and actually it discovering the next practices for our field by letting go of ingrained assumptions. And it's that last one, or the middle one on the screen, letting go of ingrained assumptions that we regard as one of the roots of innovation, because unless you can think differently and come at this from a different point of view than you have in the past, what we find is that attempts at doing things differently and innovating over about six months will erode back into being minor changes to business as usual. So it's important to think differently before you try to act differently, I think. When asked the difference between these two uh, types of response, Heifetz says, well, if you've thrown all the technical fixes you can at the problem and the problem persists, it's a pretty sure sign that there's an underlying adaptive challenge that you need to develop, an adaptive response you need to be thinking about. So quite often in organizations, I think, it's those persistent challenges that keep us awake at night. It's the box office figures that were going down and we thought we'd stabilize, but here we are in year three and they're starting to go down again. It's the diversity of our audience that we really thought we'd tackled with those special shows we did two years ago. But here I am looking around the audience and it's pretty much what it was before then. You know, that wasn't enough. That was a technical fix. But it didn't actually address the underlying challenge. And it was this thinking about assumptions that led us to our definition of innovation for this sector. When we started this work 10 years ago, there was a daily definition, a new definition for innovation in the corporate sector, uh, but very few for the non-profit sector, so we made this up. Um, and it seems to have had quite a lot of traction uh, in the last few years. So we're saying that innovation is a kind of organizational change that has three components. It derives from some fundamental shift in assumptions in the organization. It's not just an extension of business as usual. It's, a, it's discontinuous from previous practice. It's, it's divergent. It's like a, a, a hard right turn. We often call it the next illogical step. And you could do those two things, but you'd still be involved, I think, in change for change's sake. So it seems to us important for innovations to be worth the candle and worth all the input and hassle that they indeed show promise of being genuine new pathways to achieving public value and impact. We used to say to achieving your mission, but what we discovered in doing this work is a lot of organizations prompted by this thinking go right back to their fundamental purpose and rethink it, or certainly restate it. So we moved away from that because beyond that lies public impact and value. And often organizations shift their missions when they think about what's going to help them thrive in the future. So I thought what we would do for the rest of my talk is question some more assumptions. Assumptions around innovation that you may or may not actually hold, but which I do think are often prevalent in our thinking in the sector, and suggest to you and have you speak a bit more together about alternatives that you can think of to these old assumptions. So I'm going to go through three of these and ask you to turn and talk again. The first one is this idea that innovation is betting the house on an untested idea. Uh, I think that's often the crude definition of innovation sometimes. Um, and I think it derives, at least in part, from a set of anxieties that we have around this idea of departing from our known practice and the things that we got our job for and we've made our name for in this sector. Um, Edgar Schein points out that when we're trying to do change work, particularly adaptive work, that's not about improvement but about change, about divergence, th there are two kinds of anxiety which get in the way of that. The first one he calls learning anxiety, I hope. Come on, you can do it. Whoa! Look at that, that's remarkable. Yeah, in that green box it says learning anxiety. <laughs> it's so anxious it's hidden itself from view. And uh, the second kind of anxiety is what he calls survival anxiety. Learning anxiety is when you're really scared at the idea of taking on this new thing because you don't know how to do it, you've never done it, it's not in your job description, and you might be exposed and made a fool of and lose your job. So you don't want to do it. And we all, to some degree, suffer from this anxiety about being exposed when we're asked to do new things. And the other kind, survival anxiety, is kind of the opposite. It's the fear that if I don't learn this and get on with it and get good at it, then I'm going to be seen to be a failure and I'm also going to lose my job. And our organization is going to go under as well. And Shine makes the point that adaptive change only happens when survival anxiety exceeds learning anxiety in each of the individuals in the organization and in the organization as a whole which as leaders gives us two strategic options. The first is to ramp up the survival anxiety as much as possible. This is, this is not hard, right? 
you can you can do this. There's any number of data points you can you can look at. You can look at you know provincial arts funding. Uh, no, you can look at um, the box office numbers. You can look at the model that's going on at the Canada Council uh, and the uncertainty of the future. There's any number of things you can point to that will get people much more anxious about your survival. The problem with this strategy when it comes to change is it leaves a lot, leaves a lot of people uh, querulous in the corner in the fetal position. <laughs> and <laughs> this is not a great place from which to launch innovation. So Sean suggests to us that it's actually a better strategy as a leader to try and do everything we can to reduce the learning anxiety so that the survival anxiety will exceed it without having to be ramped up. So how do you do that? Well, his advice we found very useful in terms of how you can reduce learning anxiety that we all feel when we're asked to be even begin to engage in new ventures that are not ones we're familiar with. First of all, having that positive vision, recognizing there is a radical intent our opposition to this idea that innovation is test betting the house on an untested idea is to say that innovation begins with small experiments with radical intent, a phrase that's become quite well known and associated with our work. And I think both halves of that phrase are important. These need to be small experiments that don't bet the house, that don't disturb the culture so much that you're, you're in danger of exposure. They can be a new conversation, a survey, something you add on to an existing event a new way of bringing people together. Small experiments, but they must have radical intent. In other words, they must prefigure and help you learn about what it, life would be like if that long-term vision was achieved. So it's quite a trick to design those small experiments so they have both elements in place. And then find a safe practice field. I love that phrase, even though it takes us back to soccer. Um, in which people can rehearse the future without the exposure of feeling this is for real. So doing small experiments in a way that's not going to make a huge difference, but can give us some inkling of learning about what we might actually do, uh, which is safe enough for people to feel they can invest in it. Provide coaching and feedback so that people feel this is a positive experience and reward small steps forward so that we celebrate those early small wins that can help us begin to have the courage to go for the longer term vision, which means we embrace rather than avoid or suppress errors. Failure is the way we learn in this environment and has to be radically rethought as not being a negative but as being absolutely essential to how we move forward. So my first question for you is, if we're going to question this old assumption, when you think about the kind of complex challenge you were just discussing with your, with your neighbours, are there small experiments with radical intent that you could carry out just to begin to test what might be a way forward that's different for you in addressing this challenge? And how might you otherwise reduce learning anxiety in your organization so there's more openness to this possibility of change? So thinking back to that challenge you may have been talking about, spend a few minutes just discussing with your colleagues in your groups, small groups, these two questions. Thank you. OK, thank you. Pause your conversation for a moment. It's pretty reliable. Five minutes is when the volume increases. It seems that way. So thank you for sharing your thoughts about those questions. And for those of you who are asking the question online and here, uh, we will be circulating these slides if you want to make any more use of these questions uh, in your organizations or in other circumstances. So we'll make sure that's put up on the Alliance website, the Summit website, after this. But the second assumption I'd like you to spend a few moments on has to do with the premise I was suggesting about the shift in the eras for the arts. Oops. The innovation, in fact, is all about growth. And I think we are caught in this web uh, in so many ways, from macroeconomic thinking through the corporate sector right the way down to our little non-profit arts organizations, that growth is the thing. Growth is what it all depends on. Um, and I believe this is really dangerous and unhelpful. Um, we seem to know little about right-sizing and about deepening our service rather than just expanding it. But we're going to have to learn that because those of you who study systems and system dynamics will know that there are basically two fundamental structures that drive systems to become complex. The first is what we call a reinforcing structure. Reinforcing structures cause things to go on growing or go on declining. It's like interest that compounds in the bank on the money you have there, or at least it used to. 
It's about uh, population explosion. It's about exponential growth that builds on itself. And it's also about decline that goes in the same way. We, we fish the salmon too much. There are fewer salmon. They, on, they can't regenerate, and so we start a reinforcing structure of decimating the salmon stock. These kinds of reinforcing structures drive growth or decline. But they have limits because things change. And how they change is because there are also reinforcing structures. Reinforcing structures cause sustainability. They cause systems to find equilibrium. So just like when you turn on the shower and it's too hot and you put it cold and it goes too cold and you put it in the, gradually the shower finds its way. And all thermostats will find their way to keep the temperature roughly within a certain range. So what we have to do, I think, as we think about innovation, is to recognize that, that growth and sustainability are incompatible objectives. They are very different fundamental structures. And we have to sufficiently qualify or change the structures that drive growth to achieve the right degree of sustainability for us. And I think we do this in our organizations, at least in part, by regularly giving up doing things. To me, this is one of the critical pieces of innovating. Otherwise, what happens, if we keep on adding programs, adding activities which cost money, we condemn ourselves to perpetual attempts at ongoing growth, and we lose the sustainability. I know too many organizations that have got into doing something important that's really different, and five years later, it's still less than 1% of their budget, because nothing else has shifted to enable them to make this part of the mainstream, and they can't raise enough new funds to expand it. So it becomes really important to learn, I think, how to give things up. And, and related to that, we have to think about how much of our annual resources, financially and in human resource terms, we should be uh, allocating to the various different stages of innovation from the very beginning through to full implementation. I was asked this question a few years ago, what percentage of its annual resources should an organization devote to innovation? And fortunately, there's no answer, um, at least out there, so I made one up. Um, and the way I made it up was by saying, well, if you look at your hand, you can see you've got four fingers which go straight forward. And they're like business as usual, driving on in a certain direction. But there's also one finger which is quite deliberately going in another direction. And it's the combination of these two things that gives us unique traction with the world. So the answer is 20%. <laughs> it's my rule of thumb. <laughs> I know. And, um, and it's a bit shocking, really. Uh, and it's intended to be a bit shocking. How do you think 20% of our resources on new initiatives, new directions, small experiments, all the way through to prototyping and implementation is a big thought. But I think it's worth thinking about, even if you start this year with 2% and then 5% and more. Because what it means is you've got to reconsider what you're doing for its purpose, its mission relationship, its impact, and decide on things you're not going to do anymore, or that you could do in a new way that would achieve more impact. And you need to do that at the budget time, and also in the way you think about how you're structured, so as to give yourselves the space to develop innovative initiatives that can grow and become part of what you do as your core business. Otherwise, your innovations will be condemned to being what I call dwarfen innovations. They're dwarfed in scale, and they're orphaned from the mainstream of your organization. And that's been the case, I think, in our field for quite a while. And it really has to change. And of course, funders have to change to support us giving up things and doing things differently. So the questions for you are, I hope, what criteria do you apply in deciding what to stop doing? And what kind of process that's organized might you put in place to ensure that letting go happens regularly? These are my hardest questions. But spend five minutes on them. Just begin. Okay, let's pause that conversation for a moment. Thank you. I think you were slightly less keen to talk about that one. I don't know. So, engaging in small experiments with radical intent and building on those through rapid learning and, and strategy development on the one hand, and then having criteria and an organized process for actually giving up doing things. These, to me, are two of the critical factors in beginning to make organizational innovation live uh, in your organization. And they lead directly, I think, in a way, to my third uh, old assumption, which is that we should suppress conflict, because they do produce conflict, these two other 
forms of action I've been talking about. And it's the, my experience, at least in most organizations and most arts organizations with people so passionate about ideas, is that we're actually somewhat conflict diverse. We don't want to tread on other people because we're not in this sector for the money. We're in it because we love the arts. And so we can't possibly say no. So we don't say no, and we sort of proliferate in a quiet and rather stunted way. <laughs> so the thing is not to suppress conflict, but actually generate it and make it generative. Um, and it's not that I love orthogonal diagrams, but here's another one. Uh, last one, I promise. Um, you can look at the kind of teams that come together to do innovation work, and these innovation teams, as you'll hear in the session after this, we always encourage organizations to make really diverse in terms of background and position. So not just board members or staff or artists, but all of those. And outsiders, if you will, people who know the organization but are not part of the culture. We encourage them to come together in teams of anywhere between 10 and 15 to do this kind of work. And you can look at the journey that a, a team working on adaptive change goes through uh, in these two dimensions, at least. What's the level of agreement that we've got here about what we'll do? And what is the real adaptive potential of this strategy that we're developing? And what we find is that most organizations start off down here on the bottom right. Uh, because change is a great thing as long as we don't have to do it. We can all agree on that. But as we start to get into doing it, you can be pretty sure that the level agreement is going to go down rapidly, even as the adaptive potential rises, until you get to a place, usually after two or three months, where there's a lot of heat in the room. And there's a lot of heat in the room, not just because there's a lot of idea conflict about the future, but there's a lot of reinterpretation of the past that's going on at the same time. And it's the coming together of those two things that really creates a lot of heat. And what we want to see happen, and what needs to be carefully facilitated, in my experience, is that this team is able to deal with that heat, make it generative of not just the first bright idea, but of really deep-seated new ways of thinking, so that their trajectory can go on up and they can become more adaptive, but achieve enough consensus, not unanimity, but enough consensus that there's a permission given, if you like, for something new to happen. And that's the breakthrough result that I think is what we're looking for and what's ideal. You might ask, why can't we go from down here just straight up there? But human life ain't like that. And probably shouldn't be, because it's in the conflict of ideas that the best new ways forward are going to arise. And in fact, I would argue that there is a, an equivalent to this picture that goes just around the bottom right-hand quadrant. In other words, if you too quickly stick to agreement or take the first bright idea, you'll often end up with a sort of result which is only mildly adaptive. We often say to organizations, you need to peel off layer after layer and practice this many times to get to that place where you're coming up with things that are genuinely different. But most of the time, we don't. Because we start running for the exits when the heat comes into the room. The nearest exit is down here on the bottom left. And we simply say, I'm sorry, I I, I'm not part of this. I, we can't agree anything here. I'm out of this. And the initiative collapses. More often, I think, we trade off some of that adaptive potential in order to get an agreement. And we end up with a compromise. It's not a bad result, but it's a lot less adaptive than being up here. And then sometimes we agree that we can't agree anything at all. So let's agree to paint the doors red instead of green. And we can all go home saying we did something but we abdicate any possibility of adaptive change. This is my picture of the US Congress in action, but um, maybe Parliament too, I don't know, ex except for the top bit. But I think it's all too frequently what happens because we either suppress the conflict or we run for the exits and we don't make it generative and stick to idea conflict. We let it descend and erode into personality conflict, which can be pretty treacherous. So my question for you, and it's the last one, is in, instead of suppressing conflict when it comes to doing things that are different, how might we make it safer for divergent views to be aired in our organization? What can we actually do to create that safe practice field? And what can we do to stay in that heat of idea conflict and not let it descend into relationship conflict? What can we do in the way we manage these discussions and the way we relate to each other in our organizations across boundaries of constituency and stakeholder in such a way that we can hold this space Difficult questions, but I'd love you to spend five more minutes just sharing thoughts you may have, and then we'll conclude. Yeah. Okay, important to cut this off. Have you pause your conversation again, please?
Can't let the conflict go on too long. Those of you who are listening and watching online on the live stream, I hope you've had the chance to use the chat function to share your comments or observations. We haven't time in the talk this morning to hear back from you on each of these three conversations you've just had, but I hope you'll continue to talk about them during the break and, and over lunch and share more widely the thoughts you're having about these, moving beyond these old assumptions. I think from my point of view, if we can do these things, we can begin to find new pathways uh, to innovation, continuously carrying out small experiments that have that radical intent, pursuing resilience by regularly giving things up, and phasing investment over time so we don't start with big investments, we build as things prove to have traction in the marketplace and embracing idea conflict and making it generative. It's some of these principles and approaches that we've uh, organized into our program, so I just want to end very quickly with an overview of some of that um, to give you a sense of what we believe will now be launched here in Vancouver and for the province later in the year. I'm going to go fast because none of this is settled yet and I, uh, it may change, but to give you a sense of what new pathways programs can look like. We base our work on the fact that organizations in our sector that are able to innovate and do things differently are not, in our view, uh, the unusual ones. They're just ones that have exercised these muscles and have them more developed than in others. Innovation is not creativity. These two get, I think, confused sometimes. Creativity for me is a, an attribute of individuals, and it's really important to have creative thinkers in your team when you're trying to innovate. There is no lack of creative ideas in our sector. That's not the problem. But innovation is turning creative ideas into feasible strategies that organizations can actually implement. And that requires very, very different skills and people coming together in many different ways. So it's corporate activity, it's group work, and every organization can learn how to do it. And it's a lot more to be adaptive than simply to say, oh, we're really nimble and quick at ducking and weaving when things change. It's about getting ahead of that game so that you can actually be intentional about the kind of changes that you make. A few years ago, the Kellogg Foundation in Michigan did the first big report on organizational innovation in the nonprofit sector, and they concluded that nonprofits should embrace innovation as a part of their core competencies, saying that it's a, it's a genuine uh, process with its own distinct set of tools and procedures. And it's on that that we've tried to base our programs. We have national innovation labs, which take organizations through a multi-phase process to develop a, a significant new direction for their organizations. We have the local New Pathways programs, which are in cities across the United States and now active in Edmonton and Calgary, in which we're talking about bringing here. And we have a new program for individual leaders to become adaptive leaders that we call ALACI, or Arts Leaders as Cultural Innovators. The New Pathways program is the most important. And I thought I'd just share a few slides on its design and intentions. I think the basis behind the program is a summary of what I've been talking about this morning. We face complex challenges. They require that we strengthen our ability to adapt. And we can learn how to do that and get really good at it. We all have adaptive muscles already in our organizations. Part of the point of these programs is to celebrate and advance that kind of uh, capacity in our organizations. So celebrating and advancing the achievements of the province's arts and cultural organizations, strengthening that ability to adapt, enabling the design and testing of significant innovations, fostering collaboration and shared problem solving, and sharing lessons learned through a national dialogue. These are all the basic uh, goals of the program. The design uh, has many elements to it, potentially. We don't know which of these we'll do here yet. But the core of it is to bring people together, teams from your organizations, always your artistic board and executive leadership, to engage in not only an initial exploration of capacity, but then a series of workshops, whether they're face-to-face -face or virtually, um, which enable you to begin to think about your own challenges. Not a theoretical uh, overview of adaptive change, but actually working on challenges that you select. Uh, innovation forums that bring people together for more face-to-face -face sharing. A train-the-trainer program, which is about helping local consultants to learn how to guide adaptive work in the future so there's a legacy within the community as well as within your organizations. Doing coaching on site with each organization to go deeper and bring more people into this kind of process, which needs a lot of permissions inside most organizations. And then incubating innovation, which really is the climax of the program, which is a year-long deep dive, like our national innovation labs, into designing and prototyping a new way forward. The whole thing is put together a bit like a funnel. I won't go into the detail for now. But the idea is that any organization, I think, that's professionally managed with one full-time staff member or equivalent can usefully take part in the front end of this program, the workshops and the forums. 
And then some will say, yes, we want to go on and do deeper coaching uh, over a six-month period. And fewer again will say, we're ready now, this year, to do a deep dive into adaptive change with a specific innovation. And the idea is to potentially go round and round with this kind of cycle so that organizations can go as far as they will when they're ready for it. The kind of advantages and benefits, I think, that come from the first phase uh, include the idea of more fully understanding how my organization's capacities are balanced uh, and where we have the strength in adapt adaptability or instability and so on. New learning network. We've just found this in Edmonton where we just finished the six workshops. A tremendous new network across these organizations that have had, not had this kind of conversation before. And, and practical teaching to inform uh, and techniques to guide their future adaptive work. So I think there are significant benefits to organizations that just go through the first phase. The second includes the idea of the on-site coaching and this train the trainer program. So that the on-site coaching enables you to have more people in your organization involved in this way of thinking through and acting so that it becomes much deeper in the organization and you create more of a, uh, of a momentum towards change. Uh, and how you can further advance your adaptive capacity. And then, as I say, a number of consultants trained to carry on this work in the community afterwards. The third phase, for fewer organizations probably, is one that really allows this deep dive into doing things differently, prototyping and assessing a significant new direction uh, for the organization, and making the culture of the organization more adaptive by this lengthy engagement around doing things differently. And then, for, I think, for all the participants, for each of these phases, being part of a journey of discussion and achievement as a national conversation around adaptive change. These are the, the ways we hope to do it. And a lot of organizations, I was just capturing some ideas from some reactions from Edmonton and Calgary and our other programs. This is the kind of things that people are saying they get. More confidence, stronger skills in thinking and acting differently. A deeper understanding of the work. Actual analyses that support developing our practice, increased knowledge of change strategies that are effective, and being part of a new learning network that's local, but also in contact with others in other provinces and nationally. We hope to be in a position to launch a program of this kind later this year, and I encourage you to support it and talk to your funders as much as you can to move this forward, if it seems to you that it could be useful to your organization. And there'll be a lot more about that uh, in the fall. I've been thinking a lot about water, so I thought I'd end with water in a way. Um, not just liquidity, um, but the idea of adaptability and the idea of change. And water is such a potent metaphor in many ways. Those of you who know the Protestant cemetery in Rome uh, will know that John Keats, the poet, is, is buried there very famously. And on his gravestone there is no name, but it just says, here lies the remains of one whose, whose name was writ in water, name was writ in water. Um, and I also learned when I went there, there's another poet whose gravestone is there, the American beat poet, Gregory Corso. And he has a rather lovely short epitaph he wrote himself that I think is about the kind of fearlessness and about the openness to transformation that this kind of work entails for all of us. He wrote, Spirit is life. It flows through the death of me, like a river unafraid of becoming the sea. And André Gide, the French writer, long ago, also wrote about this in one of the, I don't know, the, the uh, bylines for our work when he wrote that one does not discover new lands without first consenting to lose sight of the shore. So I wish you well on those journeys. I hope to engage with you again soon, apart from the rest of today, uh, around actually practically getting involved in this kind of work, which is so necessary, and actually such a release from the old ways of doing things. I've been tremendously inspired by this work at the, at the energy, enthusiasm, and excitement of discovery that organizations bring uh, to their relationships to each other and to their relationship with the community by doing this work, and hope to go on that journey with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. We're very excited about the uh, potential of this program 
for BC and uh, look forward to hearing more. And, um, and I think to that end, um, all of us here who might be hopeful for this type of work actually rolling out in BC and encourage our funders to support it, um, let's, uh, you'll hear more about how we can do that. But, but the City of Vancouver and the Province of British Columbia are both very interested in this program and there may be other funders who can help to contribute to its uh, success in really helping to transform how we think about uh, adaptive change in our work. So thank you.